Very good. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I, I want to begin by um, thanking Asheville Greenworks for all of the good work it does in the area, um, and and particularly, um, you know, I, I uh, am thrilled with the urban forestry work that it does and, and the way that I can contribute to it. I also want to um, thank fellow tree keeper, Mike Zvonik, um, who's on the call tonight, who has um, done a lot of the legwork um, for this presentation and uh, ran interference here and there. So I really appreciate that. I also want to um, thank the Sand Hill Community Garden volunteers because the apples you see on your screen came from the um, Asheville Greenworks Sand Hill Community Orchard, also you know part part of the, the Asheville Greenworks um, uh, tree uh, what food tree project. And if it wasn't for the fact that we had the community garden up the hill that had the crates and had the scales and had the clientele, we wouldn't have been able to deliver 700 pounds of apples so easily and so readily to um, people in need in 2020. So um, thanks very much to um, the Sand Hill Community Garden Volunteers. Also to the Southern Chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture. This session um, has been approved for one continuing education unit. And I'd like to take this opportunity to ask if you can use the hand raise function of your Zoom um, screen, if you can let us know if you're a certified arborist on the call now. And I'll invite Samantha to break in um, after all of these, I see the hands, um, after these folks have let us know they're here and let us know how many certified arborists are on the call. Um, thanks to the city of Asheville um, and, and, and for, for providing the partnership that um, makes this presentation happen. And then I referred to that 700 pounds of apples going to people in need in 2020. I wanna thank the apple pickers. Um, we got out there and started picking when um, we saw the opportunity and worked with the community garden to get those to people in need. Um, and that was Mike Zvonik, Bruce Thomason, Jean Thomason, Becky Gillerin, and Amy Brooks. So thanks so much. Um, we, we couldn't have done it um, hauling all those apples up the hill to the scales um, without, without that group of people. So moving, moving on, I am, there we go, advancing the screen. So our purpose in this session is to get you ready to help out in an Asheville Greenworks food tree project, community orchard, and or to grow tree fruit at home successfully. And as we promised, there are some basics that, um, that your awareness can, can help you to uh, grow fruit successfully in either place. A little more fun is this chant that comes from a traditional apple tree wassail. If you're familiar with this folk um, practice, this folk tradition, people would actually go into their orchards um, sometime around Epiphany and wake up the trees. And they would do it by pouring cider onto um, the ground around the trees. The wassail queen would put a piece of toast in the largest apple tree and they would chant or sing different wassail songs. So I don't usually read slides to you, but this is one, apples now, hatfuls, three bushel bagfuls, talatolfuls, barns floorfuls, little heaps under the stairs. And so that speaks to the abundance that we hope to see from our trees and that they centuries ago hoped to see from their trees. Getting on, what do you wanna see from your trees? These days we have about 6,000 named varieties of apples. So here's a display showing just a small selection of those and what they look like and how they behave. Before many of our heirloom varieties went away due to mass distribution, um, focusing on apples that would keep longer under long transportation, we had somewhere around 20,000 named varieties of apples. So it's um, 
uh, still a pretty daunting task for you to choose what's going to work best for you. And it may not be at your favorite nursery. It may not be at the big box store that's selling fruit trees in the spring. If you um, want to avoid disease, if you want to get the kind of, of um, outcome from your effort, you might need to, to order the trees from someone who's going to give you the variety you're looking for. So let's get into what some of those first steps are. Um, we will talk about what a good site looks like. And next I'm going to be um, helping you find some disease resistant varieties that will work for you. It's also necessary to put a few other decisions through your screen. Um, whether you want a dwarf, semi-dwarf or full-size tree, um, that's gonna be driven by whether or not you wanna get up on a ladder or climb the tree to get, to get apples out. Um, also, whether you want early, mid-season or late um, fruit coming from the trees, what the use of the fruit is going to be, um, fruit qualities, and again, the length of storage. Um, there are apples that, will, that are great for fresh eating but don't last very long in storage, and there are other apples that can last a very long time in storage. Um, covering pollination and planting and caring for the trees are other bits that we'll touch on as we go. Samantha and Eric, are there any burning questions at this point? There are, a few there are a few questions that um, we may be able to answer throughout. Uh, for instance, one from Mary Lou asking, I'd like to hear some ideas on increasing fig tree production. Um, there's another question from Katie about how can you, how can you propagate an apple tree at home? I'd like to clone an old apple tree in my mom's yard. One from Gordon about can Fuyu persimmons be grown in Arden? I can answer that one. Uh, and then there is a community has a, a plum tree. There is a black fungus on it. What organic compound can be used to treat it? And uh, when should it be applied? So it's so really, really great uh, fruit tree questions coming up. Wonderful, thank you. Um, shall, some of those are so specific. I think we probably might want to answer those individually. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Okay, or maybe at the end if we can get to those. Yeah, we can, um, we can, totally, we can totally get those, yeah. yeah. I will confess that um, this presentation is going to be somewhat Apple-centric, but some of, uh, many of the topics apply pretty much um, consistently to other fruits, and you'll, you'll, you'll see that as we go, and will be kind of mountain-centric. We are growing fig trees at the Sand Hill Community Garden, um, but it's really hit or miss as far as whether they actually bear fruit from year to year. Um, the official word from the extension researchers is don't even try in the mountains, but we do get a big fig every now and then. Um, Blue Ridge apple growers are pretty much our local authority on uh, what can be grown here and I would invite you to have a look at their web, the website. The, the address is there at the bottom of your screen. I think you'll also get it as a handout later. And that listing of varieties is pretty helpful. I'm then going to turn to the small orchard guide that comes from NC State. And looking at the recommended varieties of apples um, for North Carolina. Um, you see them at the center of your screen. I won't read them to you, but I will suggest that you would like, you will want to consider what your priorities are. If you don't want to spray your apple trees, then please make sure you're choosing a scab resistant variety and other other disease resistant properties. So moving on, we're gonna come back to the slide in just a minute, but moving on here is from a website I'm gonna show you in a moment, a list of apple scab resistant varieties. And I don't think you probably memorized the list that I showed you a moment ago, but we'll go back and forth um, on this list for 
um, scab resistance. We have Enterprise Gold Rush, Gold Rush, John Afree, Liberty, Pristine Red Free, and Williams Pride. Going back to the recommended varieties for North Carolina, only Gold Rush of all the recommended varieties for North Carolina from this list is resistant to apple scab. So um, you've got your work cut out for you if you want to avoid the diseases that many traditional orchards spray for. So I am going to um, I'm going to switch screens here for a moment and go to that website. I do confess this is a University of Missouri source, but they are researching apple cultivars that are grown in North Carolina. I recommend this website to you because it will help you to sort out what varieties have resistance to apple scab, to cedar apple rust, to powdery mildew, and to fire blight, which are devastating to trees in the orchard and also will totally reduce yield, sometimes kill the trees as fire blight will. So there's a slider here and you can look up and down. If there's a particular variety you want to grow, say you really want to grow a Lodi, you're going to find out that Lodi is susceptible to scab, but it's resistant to cedar apple rust, um, susceptible to powdery mildew and fire blight. So it's, it's really helpful to put the varieties you're interested in through the screen. Um, next is this really great table that helps you to understand the harvest date of the different varieties, whether you want to go midsummer or whether you want to go all the way to October. It's, um, it, it's, a, it, it's a useful decision. And then properties of the apple. We know, for instance, Lodi is medium sized, yellowish green, sweet tart. Um, so you can use this resource to help sort out the disease resistance factor as well as things like specific problems with certain varieties. For instance, um, Arkansas Black. Um, it's grown around here and it can store for a very long time, as long as you can get it through the disease season without problems. And then primary uses. Do you want apples for fresh eating? Do you want them to store a long time in a root cellar? Do you want to use them for sauce and for baking? You can, you can look around on this list and see what's gonna work for you and really um, cross-reference it with the disease resistance so that you can have success. Um, I encourage you to be totally ruthless about the disease resistance, especially if you don't want to be spraying. Um, questions about this website before we go on? I'm going to switch back over then. Oops. All right, so I do encourage you to spend some time with this University of Missouri Extension web page. Also, biennial bearing is something to consider. If you don't mind only getting apples every other year, by all means, grow Fuji. Um, if you want apples every year, then you would want to look more closely at the trees that have a low biennial bearing, such as the Galas, the John and Golds, the Granny Smiths. And you can sometimes work with the tree to, um, even if it's slightly inclined to, to have biennial bearing, which means it has a heavy crop one year and no crop the next, um, sometimes your pruning practices can get a moderate tree 
to bear every year, but I wouldn't count on it. Uh, there are so many other variables. Um, so something else to consider. I promised you a little bit about sight. Of course you want full sun. You want sun all day. You want sun as long as the sun is shining. Favorable temperatures we have here in the mountains. Um, they don't grow very many apples in Georgia or Florida um, because they don't have the winter chilling, the hours of winter chilling that an apple needs. Um, air drainage is so important. That's why you see so many orchards that are grown on a slope. A really good example of that is the Sand Hill um, Orchard um, over there at, at the sports park. And then I'm gonna skip to a water source especially during the first few years that you're trying to keep young trees alive through perhaps a dry spell in the summer or three, um, having a water source nearby is useful. So my gallery is covering up um, with favorable soils. We'll talk about fertility and drainage. Um, we've got clay soils, some clay soils here. And if you're familiar with percolation tests, digging the hole, pouring the water in, seeing how long it takes for the water to drain through, I'd encourage that. Um, apples are in the rose family, as are most other fruit trees. And they're notoriously intolerant of, of standing water and imperfect drainage. Um, they'll, they'll die quite readily if they have imperfect drainage. So um, make sure you've got that good drainage. And then here is a soil test from June of last year. This is a busy sheet. I sent in um, some soil samples from the Sand Hill Orchard back in the fall. And as with everything else with COVID, those results are not back yet. So I actually used a soil test that had been taken on up the hill in a blueberry in a blueberry bed. One thing to be aware of is that you know fruit trees are going to need somewhere in the neighborhood of pH six to six point five. The pH on this site is six point nine, um, up there just up the hill from from our from our trees, a um, little bit higher than optimum, and. Because this was a blueberry test and blueberries prefer a more acid soil, the lime rec recommendations were zero. If I were actually showing you a fruit tree test, it would have given some lime recommendations. And I'll talk in a moment about when, when the lime should go down. And then fertilizer, probably pretty consistent, 10 pounds per thousand square feet um, on the trees. So, this is just an example of a soil test. When you take the soil sample and send it in to a lab, you're, um, you're usually filling out a form that says the purpose you know, for the planting. And so uh, the, the results usually come back specific to what it is you're trying to grow. Moving on to a little bit about planting. With fruit trees, it's absolutely necessary to keep that graft union above finished grade. Fruit trees are typically grafted, especially apples, pears, cherries, are grafted onto dwarfing rootstocks. And there is a graft union above um, the, uh, the, that you want to have above the ground. Otherwise, it can sprout. And then you end up getting the genetic material from the rootstock growing above ground rather than your cyan wood. And whether you're growing a tree from a pot or whether you're growing bare root, try not to dig very deeply. Um, Arborist science has found that when you dig a very deep hole, then there's a lot of settling and you end up with the tree deeper in the hole than you wanted it to be. So there's a reason why you're seeing the bottom of that hole flat and undug. Um, when it's a larger tree that maybe came in a pot, you want the bottom of that root ball resting on undisturbed soil. 
any pruning you do at planting time should really just to be to remove broken um, material that perhaps had, had happened in transit. Not much fertilization, if any, at planting time. Support in the form of, you know, this is a, a central leader um, kind of situation. So uh, a stake in an orchard, a stake going straight up along the trunk is usually fine. And then protection from mammals. This could mean wrapping the trunk so that rabbits and other mammals are not chewing on the trunk in the wintertime. That, that inner bark is so tasty to them. If there's enough snow and you have wrapped the trunk, you might find that the mammals come along on top of the snow and eat the lower branches. So sometimes it's necessary to actually put a, a, a circle of fencing around the tree to keep the mammals off of it. Um, so just some basics about planting. Going to the central leader shape. We have a couple different shapes um, in general that fruit trees are trained to. The central leader is often used for the poem fruits, which would be the apples or the pears. And that in this, it, it would, would consist of a wide bottom, narrow top, pyramidal, Branches well spaced and 90 degree branch angle. What's with that? Um, research has shown that that's one of the that's one of the most stable angles for wood to be growing in. It's counterintuitive. You kind of want a V rather than an, uh, a V rather than an L. You would think, but the L is actually more stable. So 90 degree branch angles. We. I'll, I'll come to a slide in a moment about how we get that done. This is the slide to illustrate the kind of rabbit hole you can go down if you want to talk about different ways to prune or to train to a central leader, um, depending on whether you've got a full-size fruit tree or a dwarf or a semi-dwarf. There are um, a couple of different options there, going anywhere from the skinny spindle to the freestanding central leader. Just to give you an idea, there's, there's more depth here if you want to find it. I talked about those branch angles. Here are a couple of methods that have been used. This technology has not changed much in centuries. Um, spreading out those branches to try and get something closer to 90 degrees. Sometimes it's a, as on the left, it's a weighted bucket that's attached in a way that it's not damaging the limb or um, tools called spreaders, which can be made of plastic or wood. They can be homemade. Um, they don't, you don't have to go out and buy them, but you, if you've ever lived with a pear tree, you'll know that that pear tree just wants to do this. And when you get the branches spread, then you're getting it more like this. Hormonally, a fruit tree gets different signals when the branches are vertical versus horizontal. And the vertical branches don't bear as much. So getting those, um, that horizontal nature, getting those 90 degree branch angles is, is pretty necessary to get good production. Going to the stone fruits, the peaches and, and some of the cherries, open vase is a very typical training method where you have a wide top, the branches are well spaced, it's open in the center. That's really hard to make yourself do when you have your peach tree whip um, and you've got to take, take the top out of it to start forming that, um, that open base. Um, support is also complicated because you now don't have a central leader to run your stake, to attach your stake to. A um, little, little more complicated. I want to make a distinction between training and pruning. Um, training guides the tree growth to that desired shape and form that's going to work best for the variety you're growing. And pruning is the removal of some portion of the tree. And it's used to, um, to remove dead wood, to correct or maintain structure. And, and I, the, the bottom comment is in quotes because it comes from 
the North Carolina Small Orchard Guide that says it's more efficient to direct tree growth with training than to correct it with pruning. And if you've ever walked into an old overgrown orchard with your pruning tools that hasn't had any work on it in a while, um, you get that. Couple different things about pruning types. I want to make sure that you have a chance to understand the difference between heading cuts and, and thinning cuts. So on the left is, I'm going back and forth between screens here, is an example of a heading cut where without regard to where the branch unions are or where buds are, the tip of the branch is taken off. And with a thinning cut, you're actually going back to a branch union and removing an individual branch at the branch union. You can imagine that the thinning cut leaves a much more natural appearance. And in general, the, the thinning cuts are, are more desirable, but there is a place in orchards for the heading cut. And um, maybe we can give some examples of that. But this, this shows you what the thinning cut looks like when you're, say, removing small branchlets from the bottom of a limb. Maybe you're doing this because you don't want the guy who mows the orchard, Eric, to get whacked in the head with, um, with, with branches growing downward when they're not bearing that much. So the other thing that, that those thinning cuts in this case do is they take some weight off the branch. Part of our job in pruning is to keep the tree open and exposed to air circulation and light so that the fruit can, um, can mature and color up appropriately and can also be freer from disease. When you get good sun penetration and air circulation, diseases are not favored. Most of the fungal diseases are, are not favored. So you wanna get the tree opened up, get sunlight and air through it. And the thinning cuts are uh, pretty key to doing that. When you make a heading cut, you get more growth um, behind it, more buds breaking. I also wanna make a distinction between dormant pruning and summer pruning. And I'm gonna ask you to try to, I'm using the expression at the tops of these columns that dormant pruning invigorates and summer pruning debilitates. And I'm gonna ask you to try and remove your sense of value from invigorate and debilitate because um, there's pros and cons. Uh, there are pros and cons to these. Dormant pruning, pruning is invigorating because you've got stored car carbohydrates during the dormant season down in the root zone. And when you remove tissue, when you prune in the winter, those carbohydrates come up, the sap rises in the spring and supports a lot of sort of recovery growth that may or may not be desirable. But what, what's happened there is you have removed canopy and you still have a whole bunch of carbohydrates coming up to support canopy that's not there anymore, okay? So, um, in the dormant season, we want to limit our pruning to removing damaged or diseased or dead wood, or, or if there's some necessary cuts to be made to, to keep the training of the tree moving along. Those are all appropriate. We want to try and do dormant season pruning as late in the season as possible to avoid cold injury. And we want to start with the palm fruits, with the apples and pears because they're more cold hardy and end with the stone fruits. And then even within a species, you've got a row of apples and some are old and some are young, start with the oldest trees and end with the youngest trees um, because the youngest trees are more prone to cold injury. Now, what about all of those vertical suckers? Um, down low are the water sprouts, up high are the sucker shoots. And those are not very productive. They, they're not going to provide a lot of fruit to you. And they're, they're creating shade 
that keeps your crop from maturing appropriately and getting to a good size. And it's so tempting in the winter to take those vertical suckers out of the tree. And what happens when you do, because dormant season is in, dormant pruning is invigorating, is you get twice as many sucker shoots the next day, the next, I'm sorry, the next season. So I, I can hear the head shaking. Um, I think everybody who's ever done work in orchards and, and with fruit trees has probably done this at least once. Um, so save the sucker shoot removal until summer. Um, the reason why summer pruning is debilitating is because the carbohydrates have already come up from the roots and you're removing them. Um, so the tree is less likely to, to send up more sucker shoots because they've already, they've already used the carbohydrate um, to, to produce the ones that you took off. Um, so stop before August with summer pruning because you also don't want to foster new growth that could be, um, have some freeze injury in an early freeze in the fall. Sometimes, especially if you're dealing with an old overgrown orchard or a tree that maybe the previous owner hadn't taken care of and, and here you are, you've got some big cuts to make. And I want to introduce you to the idea of um, compartmentalization of decay in trees. It was um, the result of the really groundbreaking work done by Dr. Alex Shigo at the University of New Hampshire in the 1970s, where he, he and his team determined what really happens with tree decay. And one of the things that they found out was that the trees are very good at compartmentalizing decay. And that in the case of this left-hand branch here, you've got a dead branch, that the growth rings associated with that branch, once that branch is dead, are going to decay regardless of what you do. And that's perfectly fine. The decay will compartmentalize. compartmentalize. Um, but on the right-hand side, we want to understand where to make the big cuts, in this case, right outside the branch collar, to help the tree to close the wound as readily as possible. When in a situation on the left where you've got that dead branch, every growth ring associated with that dead branch will decay back into the tree, back into the trunk. And you'll have, you'll probably have a hollow, but you'll have much more decay than had you removed the branch at the branch collar, just outside the branch collar. Um, it was, determined that there's a whole lot of, there's a lot more cell division going on in this part of the branch, which is one of the reasons why it closes more readily. And so if you make your, if you remove the branch just outside the branch collar, it's more likely to close well. Notice I'm not using the word heal. Trees don't heal, but they do close wounds. Um, when we're together in the orchard, for those who can um, come and help with winter pruning, We'll show you how to make that three point cut so that you're not tearing bark away with the weight of the big branch. Um, but staying outside the branch collar is, uh, just outside the branch collar is a good thing. Um, I wanted to say a word when we're talking about um, large cuts. On the left, you'll see a cut that closed completely. And on the right, one that did not close completely, probably because it was, there was a dead branch there. Um, what you want is what's on the left. And it's doable if you make a good cut. I did, um, I, hope, I hope someone has asked about pruning, um, pruning sealant or um, what did I call it, wound dressing. I thought I'd bring some to show you today. And want you to know that Alex Shigo's research in New Hampshire in the 1970s determined that wound dressing is completely unnecessary, totally cosmetic. Um, no matter what kind of material is used back then, there was asphalt being used. Um, there was also you know, products like this 
also black paint. And Dr. Shago and his team determined that in many cases, the wound dressing was actually uh, interfering with the departmentalization of decay. And that sometimes uh, trapping moisture where it didn't need to be trapped. And so consider wound dressing to be completely cosmetic. Now, sometimes you make a big cut and you need to cover your tracks and you don't want a big shining white wound right there when um, maybe you don't want someone at your house to know that you made that big cut and you know who you are. So, um, uh, you know, the makeup for trees, you know, this is, this is to cover up those spots if you really feel like you need to make the big, you, you need to cover up that big cut with some makeup. All right, moving on. If you want to know more about training and pruning fruit trees, please find this guide online. It is um, the Training and Pruning Fruit Trees Guide for North Carolina. Web address is right there for you. I'd like to review just some of the stages of um, fruit tree growth through the growing season. This is kind of the vocabulary lesson on top of all the other vocabulary you've gotten tonight. Especially if you are concerned with disease control and especially if you're concerned with insects. It's uh, good to get familiar with these expressions because different insects will appear at different stages and certain diseases, if, if you're going to try and prevent certain diseases with um, you know, some, some sort of solution, whether it's um, um, organically certified or not, that um, you will need to be aware of the developmental stage of the tree through the season. So, um, so please be aware of that. I think I may also um, have it somewhere else, but I wanted to talk about June drop for a moment. Um, June drop isn't necessarily in June. It might be May, it might be July, but it is totally natural for fruit trees, especially apples, pears, to drop fruit early in the season. They are self thinning. They are thinning their own fruit, which is great so that you don't have to. Um, even so, sometimes trees that are, that are just so heavily laden with fruit that the branches are going to break because the pruning hadn't been you know, done quite on top of things, um, you, you, have, you have to go through and thin the fruit so that the remaining fruit can get to the optimal size. You know, so um, June drop is not bad. You're going to get some June drop. And if you don't, you might have to go through and thin anyway, just so that the, the, the fruit can get to optimal size. Um, here's a Gantt chart for the Sandhill um, Orchard. And just to give you an idea of the different jobs that need to be done through the year, um, I like to say it's all downhill. Um, so in the winter time, we're, we're pruning early, uh, late winter, early spring, a little bit of fertilization. Um, we want to prune the stone fruits first and plant new trees before the heat comes on. Um, you know, planting, planting new trees, bare root is uh, something you want to do well before things warm up. In North Carolina, soil testing is free from April through November. So that's why I have that item there in case you wanna do that. Um, talked about June drop, and it might be necessary to go through and thin even after the June drop. Removing suckers and water sprouts as I discussed and checking trees. Sometimes if you have a branch that's just totally overburdened with fruit and you've already thinned it, to a place where the, the fruit have, have enough support um, from leaves on the branch, you need 30 leaves for an apple, right? And so maybe you've got the, you've done your, th your thinning, you've got the, the apples, um, the fruit spread out, but the, but the 
limbs are still so heavy that they're going to break. You can put those limbs up on, on crutches, believe it or not. Um, and, and that's sort of a stop, stop gap um, way to support a you know, heavy fruiting during that time. Harvest time might go from June or July into October, depending on what you're growing. And then you might want to, um, depending on your soil test, add some lime uh, in the fall. You, you add it in the fall so that it can percolate in um, you know, over the winter with the winter rains. And then you might late in the year or early in the year want to wassail those trees, which is totally unscientific and a lot of fun. Uh, moving on quickly with some pests. Just want you to be aware of the top three insect pests um, hereabouts on, on apples and the top diseases. They're all pretty devastating, which is why you want to choose disease resistant varieties as much as possible. The apple scab, scab on this leaf on the left looks so innocent, just a few black spots, right? But the tree can be totally defoliated by August if it's a bad scab infestation and if it's a, if it's a susceptible variety. And then look at, look at what it does to the fruits. Um, you need 30 leaves to make an apple. So if you lose all your leaves by August, you might not have a crop. So um, apple scab is something to, to seriously avoid. You might have seen cedar apple rust, um, the really cool sort of body snatcher looking galls in the upper left corner on the cedar trees that sort of come out with the first rains of the spring. And this is a disease that goes back and forth between the cedar trees and the apple trees. Um, so if someone is putting a whole lot of resources into establishing an orchard, they're usually making sure there aren't any cedar trees around. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a serious matter. And then coddling moth is an insect that is troublesome. Also apple maggot on the right. And I'm seeing the questions flashing up on the screen. I'm, I'm hoping we can get to them, but one of them is um, what's, worse than finding a worm in your apple, finding half a worm in your apple. So moving on to troubleshooting. These are the kinds of questions that when I was working in extension would come in from people who already had fruit trees in the ground and were having not much success with them. First of all, they might be wondering why their fruit tree isn't flowering. And a soil test would perhaps reveal what's going on there. In general, we know that um, nitrogen fertilization promotes foliar growth, growth of the leaves, and that phosphorus tends to promote fruiting. You need both in proportion, but if you're heavy on nitrogen, if your fruit tree happens to be in a lawn that's getting fertilizer, you might be getting leaves and no fruit. So checking for fertility would be necessary. Flowering but not setting fruit. A couple things to check if you're getting flowers but no fruit. Do you have a pollinator? Now the pollinator is going to be the tree that provides the pollen um, so that the fruit can be produced. Some varieties are self-fruitful. So if you only have room for one fruit tree, you'd wanna be ruthless about choosing a fruit tree that's self-fruitful. Or if you've got room for more, you would want to make sure that your trees are able to pollinate each other. Now, what is a pollinizer? Um, the pollinizer is the insect that brings the pollen to your flowers and your fruit tree. So what's happening with the pollinizers? Do you have you know, do you have, have the bees and do you have the other insects that are pollinizing the trees? What happened with the weather at bloom time? Was there a cold snap? Were, was, were there days and days of rain? Sometimes you don't get fruit just because the pollinizers can't fly. Um, it's just too cold or too wet. 
Um, you would also want to check for, for pruning and spacing issues, um, keeping in mind that, that you need to, uh, the tree needs to be open enough for air and sunlight to get through. Again, fruit drop is normal early in the season. Um, if it's dropping fruit other time, you know, if it's dropping fruit way late, could be that it's overripe and it needed to have been picked. Uh, but do know that some drop early is normal. And then varmints. I grew up with a peach tree that the moment the peaches were ripe, the squirrels showed up and stripped the tree. Um, we've experienced the uh, business of rabbits walking on top of snow and removing lower limbs from otherwise protected fruit trees. And then in the Sand Hill Orchard, there's the occasional bear um, and deer. So um, you're almost always limited to exclusion, um, which means you're fencing them out. You're either fencing them from the individual tree or you're fencing the whole area. Um, I once had a South Carolina nurseryman told me you're just not eating enough rabbit. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's trapping and, you know, if you, if you live in the appropriate place, uh, perhaps you have other means, but um, be aware that varmints could be part of why you're not getting fruit. A bunch of raccoons can pretty much strip a tree in one night if they're hungry enough. I wanna leave you with another good resource. Cornell University Extension has been the only extension system that I am aware of that's been foolish or bold enough to actually put together an organic apple growing guide. So um, when I worked in extension, I happily sent people to this. Um, is it in another state? Is it in, in another hardiness zone? Yes, but the principles are the same. And what you might need to know about how to protect an apple tree from coddling moth organically is going to be the same. So I, I definitely want you to know about the Cornell Grower's Guide to Organic Apples. Reviewing our growing season in 2020, we think that, uh, well, we did weigh all of the apples that went to people in need and we 700 pounds went to people in need. We think that easily another 300 pounds were picked by area residents, which is part of why the nurse that the uh, orchard is there and also went home with volunteers. So thousand pounds, thousand pounds of apples out of this orchard this year. Um, Bruce Thomason on the left is um, using an extension pole to pick apples. And Mike Zvonik on the right is um, getting the apples into the wheelbarrow so that he can haul those apples up the hill to the community garden where they're to be weighed and then distributed. So um, I would encourage those, you know, if you are interested in helping out in 2021 to please let Samantha know. We are happy to have additional help and we'll have pruning days coming up where I'll be happy, uh, we'll get to that slide in a moment, I'll be happy to provide some training that would be necessary for the people who would want to prune in that orchard and in the other food, um, food forest projects. So 700 plus pounds of apples, again, um, this is the picture after they were washed. <laughs> um, it did take some work to get them washed, but they did make some great applesauce. Even, you know, when we went through and, and thinned in July before the apples were ripe, um, even those made good applesauce and good apple butter. So summarizing, we want to make sure that you're aware of what makes a good site for fruit trees and that you are ruthless about choosing disease resistant varieties and those disease resistant varieties may not be at the big box store and may not even be at your nursery. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of good mail order sources um, for fruit trees if you, if you wanna be really intentional about getting the properties that you're looking for and also, uh, in, you know, the properties of fruit and then the properties of disease resistance. You want to make sure you're covering pollination, that you've got the pollinator for the tree that you choose um, if it's not self-fertile. 
and you want to plant according to best practices and care for them. We do have some hands-on pruning sessions coming soon. And I'm probably gonna hand, hand this over to Samantha in a moment. Um, we'll be working this Saturday and on February 6th and on February 13th, we are strictly limited to 10 people who can commit to continuing to support um, maybe not necessarily the Sand Hill Orchard, but one or more of the other orchards that Greenworks has hosted and, and planted over the years. Um, we really want to build capacity so that these orchards can all thrive. So um, should I, Samantha, do you wanna come on and say anything else about this? Sounds like you got everything covered, Chris. Um, we are just mostly seeking local um, Western North Carolinians who would be able to continuously help us at our orchard to um, participate in this training. And if you fit that mold, um, please email me, um, forestry at ashevillegreenworks.org. Thanks, Chris. My pleasure. Well done, everybody, and thank you so much, Chris. That was a really great uh, program. I will um, open up a few questions that I were not, I was not able to answer here. Let me go up the list to see if there one. I think there was one here. Where was it? Let me go through here. I know this is mostly about apple trees is what you put this together for, but there are a few questions about some of our native trees like mulberries, for instance, does scab affect mulberry? No, hardly anything affects mulberry, which is great. <laughs> no. Hey, the good news is, is good and bad news. Stay away from white mulberry, stick with red mulberry. So, you know, there is a, there is a difference between them in our area. So we like the, we like to promote um, trees that are not going to become a problem here. Um, got a question about is a crab apple a good pollinator? Um, a crab apple, I think I know this answer. A crab apple is a great pollinator for other crab apples, but they, I don't think that they will pollinate the other malice family, if I'm not mistaken. I am not aware of, of crab apple pollinators for um, large apples. I, I do know that there are some diseases that crab apples carry that can damage, you know, regular or you know the the you know the Asian European varieties that we brought over. So I know there's a little conflict there, but there's some there is a wonderful uh, southern crab apple that uh, you can get a different varietal of, and you get yourself some really beautiful fruit from that tree every year. And it's, it makes some of the best uh, uh, jellies and products from that. So it's a really great one. Um, there's a, can someone uh, put up the NC Growing Guide in the Cornell website here? Oh, wait, they already put them up. There we go. Uh, some questions about fig trees. Um, I do know some stuff about fig trees, oddly enough. Um, the the, I don't know how much you know about fig trees, Chris. Um, we're kind of at that level with fig trees where we're not 100% in their zone. Obviously, they like a warmer zone that we can offer here. So there's periods where we have severe dieback on fig trees. But I do know that, you know, in the past, in the Fruit Nut Club, we did tell folks to look at things like a turkey fig is a very hardy one um, to, to look at and to plant it on a west-facing wall. You want it on a wall so it gives itself a warm buffer because it needs as much warmth as it possibly can. Um, and then plan that the tree is gonna get, or the fig is gonna get hammered a few times in its life uh, through some really hard freezes it won't be able to hand handle. Um, keeping the squirrels out of them, um, maybe by a cat. Um, that's a really tough one. You know, the, we've told this a lot to a lot of people that we expect damage from, from our local fauna because they were here before us. So when we put out our, we put out our, plants like this, uh, we have to think of this. My mother, she had a bunch of blueberries she put out. She put a blueberry net over it for the birds and she killed a bird and she immediately got rid of all of her blueberry nets because she, you know, she, you know, just stopped at that moment. And, you know, what was more important, her getting her blueberries or possibly killing a beautiful little bird. Um, but yeah, figs are tough. 
Uh, turkey fig is definitely going to be on the high. The Negrones are really good one as well, too. It's a great fig. Um, but yeah, they, they also like Epsom salt. Now let's see, what do we got here? Doodly 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 do. Why is white mulberry, white mulberry bad? Um, it, it can outcompete a lot of the other trees that we have in the area. It grows faster than a lot of our trees in the area and has been put on uh, the watch list for uh, uh, not completely in the invasive category yet, like a, like a Bradford pear, but it's on that, it's on that border. And so there's, there's a lot of us in the area who have, who have stopped messing around with white mulberry. They grow, they grow very fast. Um, and I want to say that there's a few varietals that are out there on the market where they've crossed reds and whites together and they have built a tree that is lower to the ground and you can get a lot more fruit off of it. So you can look at those sort of trees. You can actually take a mulberry as well too and keep uh, coppicing the tree at its very early age and get it to grow like a bush, which would be a lot easier to get the fruit off of it. Uh, there was a question on here, Chris, and I want you to double check me on this one. So an older, really large apple tree that is really hard to get apples out of because it's so big. Um, what do you do with that apple tree? And of course, um, if it is old and healthy, you know, a lot of us in this line of work is don't cut a tree unless you absolutely have to, because you don't want to invite disease into the tree. But uh, what do you have suggestion wise on that, Chris? I've worked with some old overgrown orchards and I usually will, I'm not sure if the question has to do with uh, the impracticability of getting the apples out of the tree when it's so tall. Um, do you do you know whether it's or whether it just has to do with how you prune? It? No, this is just it's a really tall tree. You want to get the fruit out of it. What's the best way to do it? Yeah, well, there's there's no there's really no making it shorter. Um, I, I would avoid you know sometimes big cuts are necessary to get rid of crossing branches rubbing branches, things like that. But, you know, I would do summer pruning to take out sucker shoots. And um, if I'm not in a position to climb or use a ladder to get the fruits, I'd find someone who could do it safely. Okay, now this is a really good one uh, from Rotus. I don't know the answer to this one. I think, I think I do, but I'm gonna hit you with this one. Do you know if an ornamental weeping cherry would pollinate fruiting cherry trees? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, that is a neat one. That's a that would take question. a long time. Yeah, that's why I wish, do you remember Bruce Mowry? That's why I wish we had him on a call like that. <laughs> he would have some, he'd have a great response for that one. Um, really, um, if, you, if you're growing a specific kind of cherry, you, you, you have the responsibility to find the list of what pollinates that cherry. And never have I seen weeping cherry as a pollinator for a fruit cherry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, they've usually taken it the other way and they've made it into a small stunted uh, ornamental tree for a yard. So they've kind of went the opposite way with it. Um, there is a question here about the right tools. Um, can you recommend some brands of saws and, and pruners? I, I hope the person asking that question can come out to the, the hands-on sessions. Um, I don't know if it's Greenworks practice to recommend individual brands. Um, um, you know, as long as they're, they're not awful to the uh -huh. people that work there or the environment, <laughs> we're okay with it. Um, I strongly recommend using human powered tools rather than power tools when you're working with fruit trees. It might be tempting to get out the chainsaw. It might be tempting to get out the pneumatic pruners. What the power tools tend to do is give you more power to do more damage faster. Um, so stick with the hand tools and you would want to make sure that you have appropriate safety gear with you, that you're wearing gloves, that you've got a hat on. Apple wood is hard, you know, and, and even, you know, you, you can scratch your scalp when you're in the tree, you know, so, you know, wear a hat, wear gloves. Um, a sliced glove is so much better than a trip to the, you know, to urgent care to get stitches. And with hand pruners and with loppers, I really strongly recommend bypass rather than anvil type 
um, hand printers and lockers. Um, there are some very good brands out there. You know, there's Corona, there's Felco, um, there's Fiskars, there's many others. And there are some, when I, when I teach pruning in the orchard, I show the, the features of the hand tools and the, um, the pruners and the saws that I find to be really useful and workable. That's hard to do here. You know, maybe, maybe a future presentation would be, you know, online show and tell, you know, pruning tools. Okay. Um, and um, for, for loppers, I strongly recommend a, um, uh, they have a, the better ones have a neoprene bumper at the center. Um, so that when the, the pruner goes like this, when you finally got through the cut, um, you're not only not bashing your knuckles, but you're, um, you're, you're cushioning that, that blow a little bit. Um, for, for tree saws, it's important to be aware that a tree saw is curved and made for the job. It cuts on the draw and not on the push. And that if you take a saw out of your wood shop, it's gonna be a lot um, harder to work with and not give you the results that you want compared to a tree saw. Um, some, some good brands of tree saws are Silky, um, which are made in Japan, or Fano Saw Works made in California. That's great. Well, I'll tell you folks, we are at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the recording, but we can, uh, Chris, I think we can go through and answer some of these questions for folks. Um, like I will say to everybody, we will make these, this recording available to you. We will email it out afterwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop now, but we can still